This is going to be the overview for the book of James, the epistle of James. Now, James, this is the English equivalent of Jacob, which means supplanter. It's got five chapters, 108 verses, and around 2,304 words. James is in the section of books called the General Epistles. James is written to the 12 tribes. See James 1.1. 1, 1. Now the author is James Zebedee, who is martyred in Acts 12 and verse 2. And the theme is the trying of your faith through tribulation will work patience. All right, now chapter 1. You'll see in chapter 1, the trying of your faith worketh patience, so endure temptation and be a doer of the word. James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes. That's a key. Very significant. This is to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. Now, you are not a part of the twelve tribes. He's writing this to the twelve tribes. This doesn't mean you can't get things out of James. It doesn't mean you can't find doctrine for yourself in James. But primarily, it's written to the twelve tribes, which are scattered abroad. And God isn't focused on the tribes of Israel today. Today, he's focused on the church, the body of Christ. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, what people call the tribulation, he will once again be focused on Israel again, the 12 tribes. And that's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, Jacob, uh, Abraham, Abraham beget Isaac, and Isaac beget Jacob. Jacob had his name changed to Israel by the Lord. He had all the 12 tribes of Israel. And for example, in Revelation, you see there is 12,000 male Jewish virgins from each tribe who are sealed in their foreheads. They make up the 144,000. These 144,000 come out of the 12 tribes. Now, James 1, 2, and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The theme is the trying of your faith. And when you have a temptation, you can rejoice in the fact that there is a way to escape. As it talks about in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So the more you are tried the more patience you get. The harder things go, the better you become if you turn to God. And you're never going to have a temptation that's impossible for you to escape. He always makes a way to escape. Now, James 1, 9, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. The brother of low degree is exalted. In Matthew 23, 12, it says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So if you are of low degree, you're going to be exalted. If you put yourself up there really high, you're going to be abased. He's going to bring you down low. Jesus Christ himself, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He got down low, and he's going to be exalted. There will be saints in the tribulation who are poor, but the Lord says to them, but thou art rich. And you'll notice in the tribulation time period, the rich are spoken of in a very negative light. And James is a book directed primarily to that time period. And you're going to notice it talks very negatively about the rich. In James 1.10 it says, but the rich... And that he is made low, 
because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. Notice a very negative view of rich people in the epistle of James. This is because this is an end times book. And in the tribulation, if a man is rich, then this shows he has taken the mark. Because Revelation thirteen seventeen says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The rich during that time will be made low. They'll be going to the lake of fire. You see, it's not a sin to be rich. There are rich Christians in this world today. But the saints will be poor in the tribulation. And it says in James 1.11, For the sun is no so sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, but the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man, the rich man, fade away in his ways. When you see verses about the sun rising, it will put you in the context of the second coming. Because Malachi 4.2 says, But unto you that fear my name so that shall the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness, arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. You see, Jesus Christ, the S-O-N, is coming back to burn up the wicked rich men in the trib with heat that is hotter than the S-U-N. So the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man, the rich man, fade away in his ways. Notice just how clear it is when you think about it that this is a in times of book. You see, Jesus is coming back to thresh the heathen in his anger. And he's going to trample over people and cut them down, just like your lawnmower would the flowers and the grass. In James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Do you have temptations? Well, then consider it an opportunity to get a crown. And the tribulation saints will be tempted to take the mark to stay alive, but they need to endure the temptation and get a crown. James 1, 13 through 15. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Sin is like this. You see something... You lust after it, and then you take it. Then it pushes you to an early grave. Because Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes that you can be over much wicked and die before your time. So sin brings forth death. And James 1.18 says, of his own will beget he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He beget us with the word of truth. And 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Being born again. When you got saved, you were born again. It wasn't just some experience. It wasn't just some feeling. When you got saved, an actual birth took place. You are born into the family of God. And of his own will beget he us, beget he us with the word of truth. You heard the word. The word came into your ears. It went down into your heart. And when you be believed on the word, you believed that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, shed his blood, was buried and resurrected. You put your faith in that. You heard the word. You believed it. You were born into the family of God. Someone planted the seeds of the word of God in me, and I got born again by the words of truth. He beget me with the word of truth. James one twenty one. Let wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Superfluity means a great abundance. The, the filthiness of this world wants to keep a man just filthy and overcome you with the uh, and its filthiness and keep you from the the light of the glorious gospel 
The engrafted word, though, is able to save your souls. It's able to get in you. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Just going around and, and, and speaking the word of God, putting it out everywhere you can, it's getting down in people. And if you get it down in somebody, you know, you may not be the one that leads them to the Lord Jesus, but if you get the word down in somebody, you've got, you've got it planted there, and all it will take is maybe another Christian come along, say something to them, or uh, just God begin to deal with this person. And then they believe, and they're born again. And all those seeds that you planted, they just come forth. And it says in James one twenty two, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You see, you can hear the Bible preached. You can hear Alexander Scorby read the Bible. You can hear yourself read the Bible. But if you don't do what it says, then you're just deceiving yourself into thinking that you're right with God. You can go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You can hear it. You can hear it all the time. But you got to be a doer of it. James 1, 23 and 24. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. When you read the Bible and it shows you your problems and sins and you don't get those problems and sins fixed, that's like a man looking in the mirror in the morning and not getting the dirt off his face. It says in James 1.25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man is blessed in his deed. So you need to use the Bible as a mirror. Whatever it says is wrong with you, you need to get it fixed. Don't just read it and not fix it. You don't just look in the mirror and not fix what's on your face. You know, you need to walk the walk and talk the talk. You need to hear the word. You need to do the word. You don't just need to go around and pretend that you're right with God when you're not. It says in James 1, 27, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You see, salvation is believing, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, religion is doing. And that's what this verse is talking about. It says pure religion. And then it talks about something that you do. Visiting the farthest and the widows in their affliction. And keeping yourself unspotted from the world. You see, but this is because in the tribulation, you're going to have to do something. It, doing something will be required on uh, whether or not you're uh, going to be going to the lake of fire or not. It's going to be a religion, pure religion. Uh, notice that it says, visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. When the Lord comes back and judges the nations, they will be judged on if they visited his people. And that's called pure religion. In Matthew 25, 35 through 36, it says, For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came into me. So, visiting somebody. It says, to visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Notice that phrase, keep himself unspotted from the world. And the tribulation, that's pure religion. You see, uh, today when, when uh, somebody sees a Christian, they say he's very religious. No, we're not religious. We've placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're Christians. We're, we're Bible believers. You know, we're, we're Bible believers. We don't go around and claim to be religious. But in the tribulation, there is a pure religion. And uh, religion is doing. And what you're going to be, what a person is going to have to do in the tribulation is keep himself unspotted from the world. So notice that phrase, keep himself unspotted from the world. That takes, a, takes on a whole new ball game in the tribulation. 
because Revelation 16, 2 says, And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and on them which worshipped his image. Those who take the mark aren't unspotted from the world. They forsook pure religion. Uh, they didn't do what needed to be done. They didn't ab abstain from what needed to be abstained from. Just like back in the garden, they t uh, God told Adam, stay away from that tree, right? He was to abstain from the tree. If he abstained from the tree, he would have been good. He wouldn't have lost the image. He wouldn't have lost his eternal life. You see, if he never ate off the tree, he would have lived forever, right? He would have had eternal life, but he ate off the tree. And just like in the tribulation, there'll be some things that you have to do. There'll be some things that you can't do. And if you do do this, take the mark of the beast, you not, you're not going to be unspotted from the world. You will be spotted from the world. You see, that's the difference then today. You see, a Christian, there's nothing that you can do as a Christian to make you lose your salvation. There's nothing you can do as a person to make you get uneligible to be saved. But that's not so in the tribulation. You see, there's differences here. There's differences in, in the way God set it up. Now, chapter 2, in the future tribulation time period, a man is justified by works and not faith only. That's not for today. I'm talking about in the future tribulation time period. In James 2, 1, it says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. You see, if you have respect of persons, then that means you are treating a certain type of people better than the other. And in James 2, 2, it says, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. You see, this is something you're going to see at work. At church and everywhere you go, you have nicely dressed people in goodly apparel, as it calls it, and you have the poor people coming in in vile raiment, as it calls it. And it says in verse 3, And you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. So the person in the gay clothing is what the rich man has on. And you have uh, people who will treat a man right because of the clothes he's wearing. And that's having respect of persons. And this is one reason I never make a big deal about what a man wears. As long as a person is wearing clothes that doesn't reveal their body or have wicked stuff wrote on it, then I think it's fine. I don't think you should treat somebody differently or think somebody's more spiritual because of what they got on. And when I listen to a lot of the older preachers, like of the Hiles crowd, they, they almost make it as a sin to not have a, a shirt and tie, like a dress shirt and tie on i mean who cares you know that's where's it in the bible that a man has to have on a shirt and tie that just makes no sense to me uh that you would judge a man's spirituality on if he has that on or not it's always been a strange thing to me that a man a man would worry so much about what another man is wearing you know that's what women do they they want to sit and focus on what other women are wearing because that's how women are, and that's okay. But a man just sits and sitting and focusing on what another man's wearing. That's strange. And if you judge a man based on the clothes he wears to church before you have even heard the words that come out of his mouth, then that's a big problem. One of, the, one of my favorite preachers I listen to is Bob Alexander. He, he never wears a shirt and a tie. And a lot of men look at him and say, I'm not listening to this guy. He doesn't even have it on a, 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 a suit and tie while he's preaching. They don't even stop to hear the words that come out of his mouth. They don't even stop to hear if he's using a King James Bible or if he's a Bible believer. It's all about what they can see with their eyes. Does he have on the clothes that I think he ought to have on? And show me that in the Bible. Where is it? Where, where is it in the Bible? that a person has to wear their Sunday best and all this stuff. And you say, well, I just was raised that way or I've just always believed or... Okay, that's fine. If you have always believed that way, if you was raised that way and that's what you want to wear, that's fine. But you got to understand, you can't just go around and say, 
well, a person has to do this to be right with God, and a person has to do this or he's not spiritual, when that stuff's not even in the Bible. And when you see these guys in the Bible, when you see these pre preachers in the Bible, John the Baptist, does he strike you as somebody that's walking around in his Sunday best, as somebody that's just always just got his hair slicked back, just looking nice all the time, I mean, he wore camel's hair and a leather girdle. When you say, well, that was the back then. Okay, well, even in the future, Moses and Elijah. I mean, what are they wearing? They're clothed in sackcloth. Um, I mean, look at Elijah. Look at the, the men in the Bible. Does it, do they strike you as people that's just going around in their Sunday best all the time? And w would it be fine if they wore a suit and a tie? Yeah, that'd be fine, but obviously they don't. So the fact that you're going around and judging everybody's spirituality off, whether they got a, a certain attire on, that makes no sense. And when you do, you're just having respect to the guy that's wearing the gay clothing. And like I said, it's just always been a strange thing to me that a man would worry so much about what another man has on. That's weird. And if you judge a man based on the clothes he wears to church before you've even heard the words that come out of his mouth, then you're having respect of persons based on their clothes. And you've been trained to think that if a pastor isn't wearing a suit and a tie, that he's not spiritual or that he's compromising or that he's worldly and contemporary. And all that is is tradition. You see, there was some time in the past that men began... To wear ties, a suit and a tie. Well, what about the Christians before that? Were they not as spiritual because they didn't wear a suit and a tie? You know, how is it worldly not to wear one? How is it compromising not to wear one? You know, I see a lot of evil people that wear a suit and a tie. I mean, look at Vladimir Putin. He always has one on every time I see him. Your president has one on every time I see him. A lot of wicked businessmen wear ties, celebrities. They wear a suit and a tie. Are they spiritual because they have it on? No, they're some of the most evil people. So is a, is a preacher that doesn't wear one, is he spiritual because he has one or not spiritual because he doesn't have one? See, you're, you've been trained to look at how a person is dressed, how they look. Instead of, is what he's saying the word of God? Is what he's saying the true gospel? Does he got the right Bible? Is he teaching the right doctrine? The focus is no longer on that anymore. It's, does he look good? Does he smell good? Does he got on the right type of clothes? Is his wife wearing a tight skirt? Things like that. And all you're doing is examining somebody's clothes. I mean, Joel Osteen wears a suit and a tie. Is he just a great preacher because of this? No. Is it wrong to wear one? No, they look good. It's it's good, modest clothing to wear a suit and a tie. But when you have a problem of judging someone's spirituality based on their clothes or treating someone different because of their clothes, that's the problem. It says in James 2, 4, Are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Think about this. In the tribulation, when people's having church underground, maybe they can't buy or sell anymore. Ain't no telling what they're going to be wearing. Ain't no telling what the preacher or the pastor's going to be wearing. So what? As long as he's clothed, He's not showing his body off. He's not wearing skin-tight clothes. Now, obviously, you know, you hear a lot of uh, pastors talk about preachers wearing skinny jeans. And really, skinny jeans is wrong. Because, I mean, what's it doing? It's, it's showing your body off, right? For a man and a woman, skinny jeans, that shows the outline of your body. That's not modest clothing at all. And, you know, that's what the Bible, when it comes to wearing clothes... You know, it talks about people wear the, can wear the attire of an harlot, and that's wrong. Because there is 
a certain type of clothes that a harlot wears. You don't want to be wearing a tire of a harlot. You don't want to be wearing clothing that shows your body off to make the opposite sex lust. You know, that type of clothing is wrong. That should be a type of clothing that is uh, uh, spoken against. But not this, oh, you got to wear a certain type of clothes to to be spiritual or part of the club or something like that. That's just tradition. And there's going to be, I mean, this it's not like this today where, you know, the average person, obviously they got enough money to buy a certain type of clothes, nice clothes. Most people do. And if they don't, they're probably just not using their money wisely many times. But in the tribulation, you're not even going to be able to buy or sell unless you've got spotted from the world. So, well, I, I guarantee you the Antichrist will most likely have on a suit and a tie. Or he wouldn't look the part, you know. But you can't judge a person based on their clothes. That's just going to get you in trouble. Because if you're doing that, a false prophet can get up and he's going to have a suit and a tie on. And if you're focused more on his clothes than what he's saying, you're going to be deceived. It says in James 2, 4, and 5, Are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world? The poor. Who's going to be poor in the tribulation? Those who can't buy and sell. Those who haven't taken the mark. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? They may be poor, worldly standard by worldly standards, but they're rich in faith. And heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. God's not impressed with your clothes. He's not impressed with your material items. He's interested in you being rich in faith. And a person can be so poor that all they have is a white t-shirt and they can be rich in faith. It says in Revelation 2, 9, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. James 2, 6, But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. Notice it just keeps on comparing the poor and the rich because James is so full of tribulation application. And there the rich men will oppress the poor in the tribulation time period. James 2, 7, Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? That's exactly what they're going to be doing. I mean, they already do it today. But at an all-time high in the tribulation, in Revelation 16, 21, And there fell upon men a great hell out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. Revelation 16, 11, And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Revelation 13, 5 and 6, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. <clears throat> and them that dwell in heaven, the rich men in the tribulation are going to be blasphemers. James 2, 8 through 10. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law... And yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Just think how many commandments you break when you, if you were in the tribulation and you took the mark of the beast and you worship the beast. You have a graven image. You see, the Antichrist, he's going to have an image. And people's going to be required to worship it. And what did, the, what did the Lord say? He said, thou shalt not have a graven image. Take unto thee any graven image. He said, thou shalt not commit adultery. You take the mark and worship the beast, you're committing spiritual adultery. He said, thou shalt not covet. Well, you're taking the mark of the beast just so you can buy and sell and get material items in this world. He said, thou shalt not bear false witness. What they'll do is they're going to lie against the saints and say that they're evil when they're actually good. That's bearing false witness. He said, thou shalt not steal. They're going to take everything the saint has. He said, honor thy father and mother. They're going to betray father and mother who don't salute the beast. They're going to betray father and mother, brother and sister, friends and family. 
James 2.14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? Now we enter the part of one of the biggest stumbling blocks for people in all the Bible. These verses cause people to teach lordship salvation. They cause people to teach that you can lose your salvation. They cause uh, people to teach that um, faith and works are required to get saved. It's all because they refuse. They refuse to look at it any other way than what they've been taught. And it just leads them to teaching works. So what does it say? What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Yes, it can. Romans 4, 5 through 6. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So you're going to get all these people running to James 2 that say if you don't have works, you can't be saved. But if you go to the Pauline epistles, our apostle for today, he plainly lays it out. It's about faith, not works. And what's the way, what's a lot of guys' way of getting around this is they say, well, you're saved by faith, but if you don't have the works, then you really didn't get saved. And that's not right either. So you got to look at the verses, rightly divide, uh, and come to the right conclusion. Uh, Paul said in Titus 3.15, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now let's look at James 2.15-17. through 17. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, was it talking about this again? Because in the tribulation, they're not going to be a, a, your brothers and sisters in the faith won't be able to buy and sell. And one of you saying to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So a lot of guys today, they're going to come to this and say, See, it's not just faith alone, it's also works. And they'll say, if you don't have works, then you really didn't get saved. Or they'll say, if you don't have works, you lose your salvation. Or if you don't have faith and works, then you're not saved at all. You see, men will use these verses to teach that if you are truly saved, then you will have works. It says, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So they'll see, they'll, they'll say, see, even the devil himself, he believes in God. So you say, so they'll look at you and say, just because you say you believe doesn't mean you're really saved. Actually, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you've put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ to be a crucified, bread and risen Savior, you are saved. Your works have nothing to do with it whatsoever. I mean, the devil believes there's, the devil believes in God. I mean, he's seen him. But he's not put his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ to be his Savior. It says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham, Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Well, Abraham got imputed righteousness back in Genesis 15 when he believed God about his seed. He didn't offer... Isaac until Genesis 22. So you see what what Abraham got, had going on was much different than what me and you have going on. Sure, his faith was a picture of our faith and that he got imputed righteousness by faith, but he didn't even offer up Isaac until after he had gotten imputed righteousness. He didn't get justified until later. You see, for me, for me and you, it's way different. When we get when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, we got imputed righteousness and justification at the same time. So why are you going to James two to uh, tell people they got to have faith and works to be saved, faith and works to get saved, faith and works to prove they're saved, faith and works to stay saved? When Paul plainly lays it out that to be saved today, it's about your faith, not your works. Why are you going to James 2 and overriding all the clear 
Pauline doctrine. You're going to James, the book of the epistle of James that says it's to the 12 tribes scattered abroad with all this tribulation application. And you're taking the unclear, the more unclear, to interpret the clear verses. Romans 4, 5, Titus 3, 15, and all those clear verses. Like Romans 3, 28, where Paul says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith you're justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Well, James 2.21 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Justified by works. When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Abraham, what he had in Genesis 15, when he believed God about his seed and God imputed righteousness, that pictured what me and you got when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and God imputed righteousness. But what Abraham had was not the same. His justification didn't come till later. And you say, well, it was justification in the eyes of men. Uh, but what men? There was no men around but him and Isaac. Um, it says in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, not by works, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we believed, and there was nothing we had to do later on to justify ourselves. We got justified when we believed. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You see, over and over, justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Justified by faith, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You see, there's nothing, no work you can do to justify yourself. Galatians 3.25, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. It's about your faith. And when you start looking at your works, to get yourself saved, to prove that you're saved, or to keep yourself saved, you're making it about you and your righteousness and about religion. When it's when when you realize it's you're you're saved by the faith of the Lord and, and the Lord Jesus Christ, you're right on the money. In James two twenty two through twenty three, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. My faith, for me and you, our faith is not made perfect by our works. Our faith was in a perfect thing, the Lord Jesus Christ. James 2, 23, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God. Believed God about what? About his seed in Genesis 15. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Abraham had faith. He was given imputed righteousness when he believed God about his seed in Genesis 15. But he wasn't justified until Genesis 22 when he had offered up Isaac. It's a completely different situation than you've got. Me and you get justified and imputed righteousness the moment we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. James 2.24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now that, that's different than what Paul told you. Because he said you're justified by faith without works. You can't put this on yourself doctrinally today. We aren't justified by works, only but only by faith. And the saints in the trib, in the tribulation time period, will have the faith of Jesus Christ, but they will also have to endure by not taking the mark. And that's where that tribulation application comes in. It says in James 2.25, Likewise also was not, Abra, uh, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, you could also say the tribulation saints have faith, but they will not be also just, but won't they be justified by works? Because they will keep the commandments and abstain from the mark in worshiping the beast. For example, it plainly says, Revelation fourteen twelve. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You see, in the tribulation, different setup. With Abraham, it was a different setup. 
wasn't like it was today. While he may have been a type of, of New Testament salvation, as it talks about in Romans 4, it wasn't the same. In the tribulation, it's not the same. Under the law, it was not the same. They, uh, they had to keep the law, and if they didn't keep the law, they offered the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it. It gave them temporary forgiveness. That's not how you uh, operate today. You're not doing animal sacrifices. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You get imputed righteousness and justified right then. You see, the Old Testament saints didn't have the blood of Jesus applied to them. The blood of Jesus hadn't even been shed yet. So what's far-fetched to believe that the tribulation time period is a different setup? It's a completely different setup. For example, when, uh, when somebody gets right with God in the tribulation, they're not put into the body of Christ. How could their salvation be exactly the same if they're not even put into the body of Christ? And if they are put into the body of Christ, then you've got the body of Christ going through the tribulation. What would then be the point of the pre-tribulation rapture? You see, you've got to rightly divide, figure out who it's talking to. Don't try to put James 2 on yourself and make it look like you've got to have works to get saved, to stay saved. And say that if somebody doesn't have works, then they really didn't get saved. You see, you got all these guys that's so, that's so in such a rush to say that there's no works involved in the tribulation that they end up adding works today in our dispensation. Because they say, you know, if you're really saved, then you wouldn't do this or that. If you're really saved, you wouldn't shack up or drink or smoke or whatever sin they, that they don't do. And they'll use that same reasoning for the tribulation. They'll say, well, if someone's really saved, then they won't take the mark. Well, today, saved people do all kinds of wicked stuff that they shouldn't do. And they're not just going to get automatically super spiritual in the tribulation. I mean, you, the, the saints just become spiritual giants in the tribulation or something. No, the, uh, there will be people in the tribulation who are right with God, then they take the mark of the beast and they're no longer right with God. But you see, there's nothing today that can that can make a saint lose his salvation or make a person uneligible to get saved. And we only made it through two chapters, but we'll go ahead and stop right there.